Hey friends, open your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter two. If you're not in a place where you have access to a traditional Bible, you can open up the YouVersion app. It's also called the Bible app and all the notes and scriptures, those have already been uploaded. Wherever it is that you're watching us from, I love you and I'm so grateful that you are a part of our family. Have you ever felt hopeless? That's heavy, isn't it? You lost your job, lost the baby, you're choking in debt. The addiction, it, it costs you your kids, the bank, they took your house, now someone else is living there, eating around their table in your living room, having Christmas around their tree in your living room, taking their daughter's prom picture at the bottom of your staircase. The divorce, it's finally final, now someone else is holding your wife's hand, kissing her lips. You're at the bottom, you're looking up, and the light, it's flickering, it's fading, hope, it's failing. Isn't hopelessness heavy? King Solomon, he said, hope deferred makes the heart sick. Wow. If hope deferred makes the heart sick, what about hope destroyed? You know, the times when we're flooded with failure, when the tide is rising and the waves are crashing, when we've lost our footing and we can't reach the bottom. When I was a kid, uh, I went to a lake with my friends Charles and Dan Payne. Their dad, Chuck, he was... He was one of the strongest, most powerful forces in all of our lives. And, and he was out just a little further in the lake and he, he was just swimming. He was just doing something that we'd seen him do dozens and dozens of times. Now, all of a sudden, he went under. A few seconds later, he popped back up with such fear in his eyes. He yelled, help! He was pulled down again and he never came back up. Guys, like we were just kids. We didn't know what to do. We were frozen with fear. A few hours later, the Coast Guard, they, they found his body down the coast and they told Miss Eileen that he'd gotten caught in an undertow. Uh, they told us probably more to try to comfort us than anything, that if, if we'd have gotten to him, there wouldn't have been anything else we could have done anyway and that he probably would have just pulled us under too. But you know, 40 years later, I'll never forget the look in his eyes or the sound of Charles and Dan's voice as they screamed out for their dad. It was the look and the sound of hopelessness, the look and the sound of helplessness. And, and some of you, you have that same look in your eyes. You have that same sound in your voice. You feel physically, emotionally, spiritually helpless, hopeless. That's why we're doing this series, Five Things to Remember When You're Feeling Hopeless, which I want to continue today with the message we're calling, You Are Chosen. Let's pray. God, we love you. We honor you. God, thank you that you are the God of hope. Thank you that you give it in abundance. It, it never runs out. You, you have an overabundant supply of it, God. And so today I pray for my friends who are watching this, who are feeling that sense of helplessness, that sense of hopelessness, that you'd give us peace, that you'd give us hope. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, years ago, I used to travel and just preach. Five years, I just traveled every week, went to different churches and and would preach for different congregations. And, and, and one time I was preaching in a church and I had just delivered what was probably my signature message at the time, it was called, Tell the Devil I Changed My Mind. <laughs> I used to love that message. And I would spit and I would shout. He used to wear a suit and tie every week that time, man. And the pastor actually, after that message one time, he said, man, you like the white T.D. Jakes. That's like telling basketball players they're like Michael Jordan. <laughs> one time when I preached that message, uh, after the response, an older lady, she approached me and the pastor and she introduced herself as Bonnie. In, in her mid-70s, she was still stunning. Despite being dressed to the nines and obviously intelligent and very well-spoken, she still somehow had the appearance of a frightened little bird. She talked to us about her loneliness, about her lifelong failure to find love and acceptance. And as I listened to her story, I thought, how is it that this woman possesses so many outward attributes but obviously lacks any inner confidence. As her story kind of wrapped up, it became evident that it was from all of these old memories that she had of rejection. Like when she was nine, she grew five inches. And then during junior high, she was always the tallest girl 
in the class. At 5'10", she finally stopped growing, and now, as an older woman, her height, it set off her appearance, but she wasn't able to see that. She wasn't able to believe that. She wasn't able to get it out of her mind, these memories of school dances when all her friends would be chosen and she'd be left alone. More than 60 years later, the hurtful words of her classmates, they still loomed, they still lingered as the narrative of her life. I, I don't know if she like thought that we weren't understanding what she was saying because she said, listen, maybe you don't know what it's like to be in a group and be the only one not chosen and have it be because of something you can't control. Like the words of those middle school classmates, they robbed her of one of the greatest gifts that God had given her. her. She was so insecure about her height, and yet that was this beautiful gift from God. You, you know what things like that do? They change your view of yourself. They create in you this sense of hopelessness. Multiple studies over the last 40 years have discovered that the way you see yourself determines the way you act. And the way that you act determines the way that you react. Those studies, they've discovered how a person's self-perception affects their self-worth and their self-worth affects their self-esteem. Those three things, self-perception, self-worth, and self-esteem, they tend to be the governing factors in our lives. Like if we see ourselves as an underachiever, we end up acting like an underachiever. If we see ourselves as a victim, we tend to let people victimize us. It's why so many things like poverty or addiction seem like they're hereditary. Because if we live in those environments and we never leave them, if we see ourselves in that light, then we're gonna live inside of that identity. Whereas if we see ourselves as special or we see ourselves as successful, we tend to end up being successful or we end up doing something special or something significant because our beliefs about ourselves determine our behavior. And like Bonnie, for many of us, that narrative, those beliefs, they originate in our childhood. They originate wherever it is that we were arrested in development. Like Bonnie, most of the narratives of our beliefs, most of the narratives of our lives, most of the narratives that we have constructed about ourselves, they're false. They come from misinformed, unauthorized sources. Like what did a bunch of middle schoolers know about Bonnie that should have affected her entire life? They are misinformed, unauthorized sources. Uh, there was this architecture student. She entered a nationwide contest for building design and the contest would be within the nationwide architectural convention. It, it was judged by a panel of kind of established architects and when she received the results, she discovered that her design had received honorable mention. She was super discouraged. She was devastated. Really, for at least a moment, she was depressed. And then after looking at all the other entries, she thought, obviously, that hers was the best. Uh, at lunch on the last day of the convention, she's... She's sitting over an uneaten sandwich looking at her creation. And, and this old man was sitting at her table looking at her creation too. Finally, not knowing who designed the building, he said, you know, I think this one's the best of the lot. Yeah, guys, she was elated. Suddenly, the ranking of honorable mention and the words of those like quasi-qualified judges, they went totally out the window because the old man who thought her design was the best was Frank Lloyd Wright, perhaps the greatest architect of that time. That woman, incidentally, was Norma Merrick Sklarik, the most influential American female architect of the 20th century, who, among other things, would go on to design the United States Embassy in Tokyo, the Pacific Design Center in Los Angeles and Terminal One at LAX, which was legendary for its beauty for decades. And she was able to do that because when an authority on a subject tells us something, we can count on it. I wonder, why is it that we're writing our stories or we're forming our beliefs of ourselves on the opinions of misinformed, unauthorized sources? Like, of course the enemy wants you to think you're hopeless. He's uninformed. He thinks he actually 
has say. He thinks he actually gets input, but God is the authority on who we are. And he says, you are loved. He says, you are chosen. You're an overcomer, that you're more than a conqueror, that you are beautifully and wonderfully made. Interestingly, in in his letter that we now call First Peter, the great apostle Peter, you know, upon whom Jesus said he'd build his church against which the gates of hell will never prevail, he tells us in the first chapter, number one, what God has done for us, which is significant. But then in, in the second chapter, he actually talks about what God says about us. And, and so from that chapter, let me give you four things God says about you. Here's the first. You are acceptable. Peter writes, you are a chosen people. In his paraphrase, the message, Eugene Peterson writes, you are the ones chosen by God from nothing to something, from rejected to accepted. You know, far too many of us spend our entire lives trying to earn acceptance. We're looking for it from our parents or our peers, our siblings or our spouses, our friends and our foes. We're looking for acceptance from the people we respect and from the people we envy. Our desire to be accepted, it influences the clothes we wear, the cars we drive, the kind of house we buy, and for some people, even the career they choose. We have an insatiable desire for the feeling of acceptance because far too many of us have felt the opposite. Far too many of us have felt the sting of rejection. Like, do you remember recess <laughs> when games were played and teams were picked? Like, remember how it felt to be picked, to be wanted? It was like you're on top of the world. It was like, ah, oh, <laughs> sweet success. Yeah, sucker, acceptance. <laughs> but on the flip side, uh, remember how it felt when they got down to like the last two or three kids and you still hadn't been chosen? Isn't that such anxiety? Doesn't it feel like, Rejection? Uh, there was a couple in Massachusetts, they received a call from their son during the Korean War. They were thrilled. It had been months since they'd even heard the sound of his voice. The, the uncertainty of whether or not he was alive or dead for them, it was, it was weighty. Their son, he told them that he was in San Francisco and he was on his way home. They were so stoked. His, the son, he said, Mom, uh, I just wanted to let you know that I'm bringing a buddy home with me and, and he got hurt pretty bad. He only has one eye, one arm, and one leg. And mom, I'd, I'd really like for him to live with us. Uh, so mom, like, like a good mom, she replied, oh yeah, yeah, sure, son. Uh, he sounds like a really brave guy. We can, we can find room for him for a little while. The son said, mom, you, you don't understand. I want him to come live with us. Uh, well, okay, the mom finally said, we, we, we can try it for six months or so. No, mom, I want him to stay for good. He needs us. He's only got one eye, one arm, and one leg. He's been hurt like really bad. He's in really bad shape. And by now, the mom, she had, she had lost her stuff. She totally lost her patience. She said, son, come on. You're being unrealistic about this. I mean, you're emotional because you've been in a war, but, but that boy, he's gonna be a drag on you and he's gonna be a constant problem for all of us. You need to be reasonable. The phone clicked. And dial tone. The next day, the parents, they got a telegram. Their son, he committed suicide. A week later, the parents received the body and they looked down with unspeakable sorrow on his corpse, which had one eye, one arm, and one leg. Friends, even with our damages and our defects, our flaws and our shortcomings, our insecurities and our immaturity, God accepts us exactly as we are. He invites us home, no conditions, no restrictions. He chooses us for his team. Here's the second thing God says about you. You are valuable. Peter says, you are God's special possession. Like how much do you think you're worth? I'm not talking about net worth. I'm talking about self-worth. You, you should never confuse valuables with value. Now to answer that question, we need to ask another question. What determines value? 
and there's two things really that value depends on. Number one, what someone's willing to pay for something, like a house, a car, a piece of art, a baseball card, they're only worth, number one, whatever someone's willing to pay for them. Or number two, who's owned that item in the past. For example, Vince Lombardi's house in Alloway, it sold not long ago for $510,000. Now, I bought a house just down the street that's almost exactly the same size for $230,000. The difference is my house was previously owned by Jim. Jim was a paper salesman for 30 years and all he did in that house was raise six kids. Where the other house, it had been owned by the immortal coach about whom the book When Pride Still Mattered was written. And he sat in the basement with Ray Nitschke and Bart Starr, Paul Horning and Jerry Kramer and reminisced about the 1966 Super Bowl. His house was worth more than double because of who had owned it in the past. So based on those two criteria, what someone's willing to pay for something and who owned an item in the past, what's your value? How much do you think you're worth? Well, the Bible says God paid a high price for you. What price? Everything. His son's life. And so because of the price that he paid, you belong to him. You are valuable. Here's the third thing God says about you. You are capable. Peter says you are a royal priesthood, which particularly in our local context and community, that can sound really intimidating. Cause like you can look at it and you go, mm, a priest, like, oh man, like I'm totally not, I'm not, man, I'm not qualified for that. If you knew me, you would know that he, he called somebody else to be a priest, but he certainly wouldn't have called me to be a priest. But here's what Peter's saying. He's saying that the two benefits priests have are now available to every Jesus follower. Number one, we have direct access to God. We have the right to go directly to him. We don't have to pray through anyone else. We don't have to confess our sins to anyone else. We don't have to experience God through anyone else. We can go directly to God. But number two, we have a responsibility to minister to the needs of others. Every Jesus follower is called to be a minister. We've all been given gifts to be able to serve other people. The message version says we are God's instruments to do his work, to speak out for him, to tell others of the night and day difference that he made for us. You know, the Latin word for priest means bridge. Uh, a priest is meant to be a bridge builder between God and man. In the book of Exodus, God says, you will be my kingdom of priests. And there's two really interesting things inside that verse. First, in the Jewish culture, a priest was defined as someone who put God on display. Next, the Jewish understanding of a kingdom is so different than our Western culture understanding of a kingdom. In a Western mindset, a kingdom is like whatever land a particular king had conquered, acquired, or possessed. But Jesus would define a kingdom as anywhere a member of that kingdom was. And so the kingdom was expanded or it was advanced anywhere that a member of that kingdom set their feet. So when you're in your neighborhood or at your school or workplace, you're advancing God's kingdom to that place. And when you get there, you are to advance that kingdom as a member of his royal priesthood, as people who put God on display. And, and you don't have to shy away from that because you are capable. Finally, the fourth thing God says about you is that you are forgivable. Hmm. Peter says, you've been called out of the darkness and into his wonderful light. In other words, you are forgiven. Like there are no three words that communicate self-worth better than you are forgiven. And God doesn't rub your sins in. He rubs them out. He doesn't rehash our sins like we do. He releases them. They're wiped out. We, we won't be held accountable for them. They're forgotten, gone, erased, treated like they never existed. Uh, there, there was a, a guy who was an extremely successful land developer in London, England, and, 
And he wouldn't settle for anything less than the best of everything. Private flights, custom suits from Savile Row, bespoke shoes, a Patek Philippe watch, and, and naturally, he would only drive a Rolls Royce Phantom. It, it was his pride and joy. One day though, his driver, he hit something on the highway and the rear axle, it broke. Uh, the dealer, they had the car transported directly to the Rolls Royce factory and within 24 hours, the car was repaired and returned to him without a bill. Confused, the owner had his assistant call the dealer to inquire about the repair. The dealer, they had no record of it. So the assistant, he called the company and he was directed to one of the executive vice presidents who informed him, well, there's no charge because we have absolutely no record of your Rolls Royce axle ever breaking. <laughs> the company's commitment to excellence wouldn't permit a flaw to ever even be made known. So it is with God's mercy. When we confess our sin, we are forgiven immediately and without charge. It is as if nothing had ever gone wrong. So friend, when you're feeling hopeless, remember you are acceptable, you are valuable, you are capable, and you are forgiven because you are God's masterpiece, his handiwork created to do his good works. You are chosen to be a royal priesthood, a bridge builder between God and man, someone who puts God on display wherever they set their feet. And so I wonder, are you doing that? If you're not, you can start right now. Would you close your eyes? You know, salvation is literally making the decision that you are going to start putting God on display everywhere you are. But you know you can't put God on display until you have God within. And so salvation is this, this process where we allow God in so that the sin and the shame that we have there will be put out. Now, I wonder if you need to do that today. Do you need to allow God in so that the sin and shame can be put out? It's a very simple process. It's not easy to live out, but it is a simple process. You, you have to do two things. You have to confess and profess. You have to confess that you're a sinner and profess that Jesus can change you. So I wanna give you the opportunity to do that today. And, and how I'm gonna do that is I'm gonna say a few lines in a prayer. If you repeat those words and you mean them in your heart, the Bible says, that you will be saved. And so if you need that in your life, would you repeat this after me? Say, Jesus, I'm a sinner, but I'm sorry. Would you forgive me? Would you change me? Would you erase everything that I've got on the inside? Would you get rid of my sin and my shame? Would you live inside of me and give me a new life, a new hope in Jesus' name? Amen. Friend, if you prayed that prayer, congratulations. I'm so excited for you. I'm so proud of you, not in a demeaning way, but in a way that lifts you up. And so if you prayed that, I would love the opportunity to connect with you. So if you would reach out to us and let us know you did that, we'll definitely follow up with you. But maybe you're watching this and you say, Sean, like I'm, I'm a believer, I'm a Jesus follower, uh, but I haven't been putting God on display wherever I put my feet. Like you haven't been putting God on display in your marriage. That's why you fight all the time. You haven't been putting God on display in your finances. That's why you're so deeply in debt. You haven't been putting God on display at school or at work. Whatever is your situation, if you say, Sean, I haven't been putting God on display wherever I put my feet. Can I pray for you? God, for my friends who love you and they want to serve you and do their best, but God, there's this tension, this pulling, this struggle. But God, sometimes they show you, but sometimes they don't. And so God, I pray for them that they would put you on, they would become so full of you that people don't even see them anymore. That, that they would be so full of you that, that you stick out of the edges. God, help them put you on display wherever they put their feet. In Jesus' name, amen.